Amen. We're going to continue our study, No Compromise. And Ursula's testimony regarding her daughter shows where she refused to compromise. I know of this, um, I don't know this person personally, but they had, her and her husband had a very large ministry and she had a large women's ministry, author of some books. And she had the stand that speak the truth in love, homosexuality is a sin, you weren't made a homosexual, and God will deliver you and we love people and teach them the truth, tell them the truth in love. However, her daughter came out as gay. And her daughter threatened her and said, if you don't accept me, I'm leaving. There's somebody, another family, that'll take me in. Now, we accept all people. We don't necessarily accept lifestyles. She changed. She compromised. Suddenly, her daughter became more valuable to her than Jesus. And you can say, oh, no, 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 not more important than Jesus. Well, when she changed what the word was saying to suit her, what became more important to her? What became number one in her life? And this is where compromise will come in. And we cannot base our walk with Jesus on our feelings. Feelings will come, but that's not what we base our relationship with Jesus on. So we know that compromise is settled by agreement with mutual concessions. And there are times when you will make a concession regarding something. But you can only do that when you're not dealing with the Word of God. If it's the Word, you never ever make a concession with the Word of God. If it's in the Word, that settles it. And I remember when we first started coming into the Word, I'd find something in the Word and I would go, well, this is what the Word says, so that can't be done. And so some, it was sort of said, like, why are you just on the word? It's the word. I said, well, God said it, so let's just move forward with it. And the point was, they would say, well, I don't see it that way. Let me tell you right now. Just mark it down in your thinking. It doesn't matter how you or I see it. What matters is what God sees and what he has told us in his word. And that has to be number one. Amen. We want the blessings. We want all this stuff. But we want to lift ourselves up where we can decide what word we're going to accept and what word we're going to reject. And we can't do that. So then they said, would say to me, well, I just haven't got a revelation on that yet. Excuse me, the Bible says don't lie. What revelation do you need? It's done. I'm not saying every time I've seen something in the Word, I've done it perfectly and never missed it since. I wish I could, I haven't. Only one person has done that is Jesus. But you don't need a revelation on some of these things. We don't need a revelation on the fact that it is absolutely, totally demonic to give children hormone blockers and cause them to have a sex change and not notify their parents. It's demonic. And you don't need a revelation of it. It's bottom line against the word of God and it's demonic. And there's zero room Zero wiggle room for compromise. There was, um, and I still really don't understand it, 
but we were watching a football game and this one guy came from the States or wherever and he really liked the Canadian football because he liked the wiggle waggle they have. I don't know what that is, but they drew a line and whatever it means. Well, let me tell you, there's no wiggle waggle with the word of God. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he never changes. And it's you and I that have to change and get our thinking in line with his thinking. And I know I'm very strong on this, but what's happening to children is demonic. And it has to be stopped. And the body of Christ has not taken a stand and they have compromised on it and they compromised back when I was in school and they took prayer out of school and you will never have a void and wherever there's a void it, you either fill it with God or you will fill it with the demonic and they kicked God out and Satan moved in reason for a school So parents, my heart is with you. As your children are in school, we just know that the eyes of their understanding are enlightened. And they are not swayed by this nonsense. It's demonic. And adults, children of God, don't ever start listening to the news or the media telling you it's okay. If you hear a lie often enough, you'll believe it to be the truth. Don't listen to it. It is not true. It is a lie. It's just that simple. It's just that simple. David said the gospel is simple. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. We don't need more than Jesus. As I said before, Jesus plus anything is nothing. Jesus plus nothing is everything you need. So we looked at all of that. We saw it's all a work of grace. Um, I, don't, I apologize, I'm not sure what scriptures I gave you. Did 2 Corinthians 11.3, do you have that one? 2 Corinthians 11.3. If not, well, that, but I fear, and here it is. Lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtility, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Satan came to Eve and says, if you eat of that tree, you will be wise. Today, too many people, including in the body of Christ, are going to the world for wisdom when all the wisdom is in God and Holy Spirit's in our spirit and we have been given the gift of speaking in other tongues to draw that wisdom out. We don't need to go to the world for their wisdom. Amen. Their wisdom is corrupted. And if you listen to it, your mind, your soul, your emotions, your way of thinking will be corrupted. And I know I'm being strong this morning, but please, there is so much corruption out there. And I have seen and heard and read testimonies of too many believers, too many pastors that didn't want to get involved. They're afraid of their giving number being taken away, their charity. We will teach the truth. And if we lose our giving number, we lose it. You have to make a decision that this is what God tells me to give and I'm going to give it regardless. Yes, I do register it. Yes, I send it in on my income tax. Why? The government at this point in time still will give me money back. And I can re -sow it. But it won't cause my giving to change if I don't get a giving receipt and that's something you have to settle in your mind Amen. and that's just the way it is because we're not going to compromise for it and a lot of churches compromised for that because of fear of man they were afraid they would lose members and they would lose money you are not my source. 
You are not the source of Living Word Christian Center. I am not your source. But God has privileged us to work through us to bless many. Amen? Amen? We don't look to our jobs as our source, but we also don't look at the people. Yes, God's raised up people. Yes, he needs he, your givers. And yes, you support the ministry. But you do that under the direction of Holy Spirit. Amen. And I'm thankful to say, no one here, no one that's ever attended church at Living Word Christian Center has ever put any pressure on David or I to preach a certain way or a certain topic or not to preach something or else they would stop giving and leave. That has never happened. That is a miracle. That's a miracle. That's the love of God flowing. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. So then we went into detail about the world's philosophy. We saw that the wise man built his house upon the rock and the foolish man on the sand. And that's because he compromised the word of God. We saw in Deuteronomy 22 that we're not to sow mingled seed, which means we're not to sow the world's wisdom and God's wisdom. It'll cause confusion. So now today, I want to look at steps to take to no compromise. What can we do to prevent ourselves from compromising? Amen. And by compromise, I'm not talking about... Um, David and I, we will compromise on whether or not the hockey game's going to be on. Or Creflo Dollar. Or the baseball game. Well, we won't go there because Dave will just switch from hockey to baseball, record one, and he's good to go. So there's compromise. One, we solved it. I have a study area with a TV, and we have another TV upstairs, and any time I say, I'm done, Dave will go upstairs and watch TV, his sports, or he will watch a study program with me. But that isn't breaking the word. That isn't contrary to the word. So in a relationship, there is give and take, and you might change some things. But you never, as I said last week, men or women, compromise the word of God. Women don't put pressure on your husbands to change his stand on the word. Men don't try and say it's what the word says and that's why you can't do it. Make sure that it's in the word. And men don't give in and not do and be obedient to the word and be the leader God's called you to be. No compromise there. Amen. Hallelujah. So the first step, I believe, in not compromising is having a personal relationship with Jesus. Knowing, number one, how much God loves you. And I know a lot of times people say, yeah, I know God loves me. And then I hear things they say, and I'm going like, no, you don't. Uh-uh. No, no. It's a cute little saying, but until you grasp that love. I remember when God revealed his love to me, showing me that I didn't have to do anything to earn his love. I had gone through life wanting to earn people's love. To be accepted, and I did what I could to earn their love and acceptance. And I did the same thing when we first started our walk with God. I thought I had to do the same thing. Now you know, some of you know that when I was 15, 16, we were, I went to a church that taught predestination. And because I was coming against some of what they were teaching and I was saying, this isn't what the word shows, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they told me that because I was 
coming against or discussing or not thinking the way they did according to the word that I probably was going to hell not one of the elect. Well, that was exciting for a young teenage girl. You know, like, so I, I you know, again, I didn't try, I, I didn't change, they didn't change my mind because I had been born again and I don't know when and I had been spirit filled and I don't know when and how it all happened, I don't know. But there's something inside. And when you're born again, there's something in your spirit. You just know truth. And never go against your conscience. Never go against truth. So anyway, later Dave was uh, a deacon there. And of course, that's the pinnacle. No, well, he was one step below the pinnacle of, of status in the church. Pastor was one, and then, of course, the elders, and then he was just a little lowly deacon, but he was on the consistory board. And when he said, well, what about this, as we were studying the word, and, and they wanted, he told them, this is what the word says. Why do we have to go through Northern Alberta classes, Canada classes, go to synod, and all these things? Can't we just do what the word says? So they told him, you have about a year left. Just come to the meetings and be quiet. That was at that time like saying sick him to a bulldog. There was just no way. And so he tried to convince him, this is what the word says. Shouldn't we be obedient? So needless to say, again, there was opportunity to compromise. And it's just something... God became so valuable to us, his word so awesome, his love. Knowing his love, there was no way we were going to compromise. It didn't matter when I was told, nobody else thinks the way you do, Arlene. And our children really liked you. Mom, everybody else can do it. And yeah, well, you're not everybody else. You're not everybody else. Compromise. You have to know. And when you truly know how much God loves you and the price Jesus paid for you to be free, you won't want to compromise. To me, to compromise is denying what Jesus did for me. It's putting somebody else's opinion higher than what God says. When God says something, that's it for me. No change. Now we have, and I told you that story, how we knew we were supposed to be debt free and we ended up borrowing. We were going to start another sporting goods store. We did all that. We've been forgiven. We've been moving forward. We have compromised. Why did we compromise? We listened to other people. And it just made sense in the natural. But when you know how much God loves you, you're just not going to compromise. And like I said, we're not going to be doing it perfect, but there's just something about knowing. I, it was so amazing to me when God revealed I didn't have to do anything to get him to love me. I didn't have to, and I knew he loved me, but then I thought I had to do something to get him to love me more. You know, that might be in the natural realm. And parents, your children should never have to do anything to get you to love them more. Or accept them. They might get, do things and uh, they might not get certain privileges. That's a totally different thing, that's discipline. But love is unconditional. When he showed me, he loves me to the max. And there was nothing I could do to get him to love me more. That was the most freeing. I really am, haven't got all the words to explain it still today. And you might say, well, Arlene, that's great. God showed you that. You had that revelation. Well, that was the end of that revelation. He didn't continue to appear to me, but he spoke to me through his word. I had to check that out in the word. Any word you get, you might think it's from God. You have to check it out in the word. 
And you've got the word that tells you how much he loves you. It's in there. So with steps to no compromise, you have to know, have a relationship with God. And that set, it's like I think of um, a baby in a crib. And they have these bumper pads when they're little. You put bumper pads. Well, maybe not today, but then the bars were farther. Anyway, you had these bumper pads all around the inside of the crib. And it sort of set a place so if the child rolled too far, their legs or their arms wouldn't go out of the things of the crib and uh, the slats and their head and all the rest of it. It was something to protect them and guard them. And to me, God's word is like bumper pads. It's guarding, guiding me and revealing to me what not to do to get my arm out into the world and have it cut off. So you use, the word then is guidance to you. Revealing to you what to do and what not to do. But you have a choice. And just remember, any time you step outside of what the Word tells you to do, one, it's compromise, and you're now in Satan's territory. It doesn't change how much God loves you, but you're in Satan's territory, and he can just make your life miserable. So the Word is guidance. When you have that relationship with God, with Jesus, and he tells you not to do something, you're not going to argue with them. The next one, we have to realize, and a number of years ago, I heard Keith Moore say this, so I'll give him credit for it. He said he was sitting waiting for, at a red light, waiting for it to turn green, and all of a sudden it came to him, God's smarter than you. And he sort of went, yeah, I know. And it came back, no, God's smarter than you. And I don't know what message it was or what else he was teaching, but that hit me. God is smarter than I am. Therefore, if I will accept that and acknowledge the fact that God's smarter than I am, and that's, you can say, oh yeah, I know that, but is the word that he speaks to you smarter than you? Or do you explain it away? For instance, I use lying. Is it a lie? Or is it somebody might say, well, it's just a little fib. What's the difference? God's smarter than I am. Anything that isn't 100% truth is, in God's books, a lie. Bearing false witness. The Bible talks about that. So I have to fill out a form to get accepted into school or wherever it might be, and they've asked a question on there, I avoid it. Or don't give the whole truth. I'm bearing false witness. I'm leading them to believe that I am something that I'm not really, because I didn't put the complete truth in. If we truly believe God's smarter than we are, and God wants us to be honest and not bear false witness, it says. And I put the truth on that resume or whatever I'm putting the truth on, completely not deceiving anybody, God will see me through. He'll see me through. Because he always has the best, my best interest. God will see me through. You have to become totally convinced that when God asks you to do something and it's in the word and he says to do it and you do it he will see you through that's covenant that's covenant that's being in Christ that's covenant good example of that in the word is Saul God told Saul through Samuel but to wipe out these particular group of people. And people have wondered why does God want these people wiped out? 
because they were demon possessed and they were going about contaminating other people. Jesus hadn't come yet and nobody could get born again or delivered. But they went so far. There's one place where God said, don't go through, I think it was the Amorites or whatever, don't go through their land because their cup's not quite full. Meaning there was still room for repentance. They were bad. They were evil. But there was still a slight possibility. If the children of Israel had honored God and lived godly, that the, uh, this group of people would have changed. So God told them to wipe these people out. Saul went there. And he decided he was smarter than God. One, he honored himself more than God. Compromise. He kept some of the women, children, and animals. See, they were even to get rid of the animals because the animals were contaminated. So he took them. And then he kept the king alive. Usually they cut off the thumbs and the toes because then they can't properly hold the bow and arrow and they can't run, etc. So they cut off the big toe and the big thumb. And the children were kept. Samuel got there and said to Saul, what is this bleating I hear? And Saul went and blamed it on the people. He said he saw they were good and we thought we'd keep the animals for sacrifice. God said, you only sacrifice yours. Those animals were corrupted animals, lame, etc. You don't give God, sacrifice God, something like that. What ended up happening, so anyway, as a result, Saul's heart wasn't right. The kingdom was taken from him. His act, thinking he was smarter than God, compromising, caused even his children to die. They didn't, his sons didn't become king. His one son, Jonathan, helped David become king. But there was a man that was kept alive, a child. And his name was Haman. One of the people God said to kill. And this child grew up hating the Jews. I don't know if any of you know the story of Esther and Mordecai. It was Haman that got the king to agree to killing all the Jews. Haman did everything he could to get rid of all the Jews. It caused great harm to the Jews, but through Esther, they were allowed to fight. But the persecution they went through, all the stuff they went through was because of one man's compromise, disobedience, no relationship with God, and lifted himself up higher than God and compromised. See, he didn't accept responsibility for his behavior. He had said, oh, well, I shouldn't have done that. But Samuel, come with me and offer a sacrifice so I will look good in the eyes of the people. Compromise to look good in the eyes of the people. Accepting responsibility for what you've done and not blaming it on somebody else is one of the greatest signs of repentance. There is zero Repentance. You can say you're sorry all day long, but until you re accept responsibility for what you've done and not blame somebody else, you have not repented. And repentance means a change of mind and heart. It's 180 degrees, so you go the opposite direction. And any of you that have with children, so often a child, we would hear this, and a kid crying, and what happened? Well, this one, time and hit me or whatever.
Well, why? Well, Brent did this, and here we go on this circle. Well, if Brent hadn't done this, Timon wouldn't have done that, and there's zero repentance because they're blaming somebody else. Nobody else is responsible for your behavior but you. And that's something important to teach our children. They may have hit you, but retaliation is not in line. And you can't blame them for your retaliation. And we like to do that. Well, if the world didn't do this, if they didn't do this, if my wife didn't do this, if my husband didn't do this, until we accept responsibility for our own behavior, there's no repentance. And that's what happened with Saul, and he lost everything. He lost everything. So, one, know the love of God. You have a relationship. These are steps to no compromise. God's smarter than you, smarter than me. Whatever he says in his word, that's final authority. Accept the word as final authority and do not argue it or try and figure it out and explain it away. Be done with it. God honors his word. God honors his word. And as you honor his word, you will be honored. Do what he says to do. Do what he says to do. 2 Corinthians 10, 12. Second Corinthians 10, 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Don't compare yourself to the world. Don't compare yourself with anybody. But too often we end up with this comparing ourselves to the world. The world's doing this. Well, they're doing that in school. Well, the politicians are doing this. Well, the ministers are doing this. Not every minister is godly. You don't compare yourself with anybody, whether in the body of Christ, but this is really, it was talking amongst themselves. But don't compare yourself and go to the world for advice. That's not wise. It might be the way the world does, and it might be the wisdom of the world, but that's not wise. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. This is so important because today we're tempted on every side to compromise, to change, and it says there hath no temptation. Everybody say no. No temptation. Does that mean there might be a little temptation? There is no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. Every temptation that comes is common, meaning in the natural realm. It's not supernatural. Satan doesn't use supernatural powers to entrap you. He uses your mouth. He uses your mouth to trap you. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. And that does not mean, and I've had people come to me saying, I'm going through all this junk, I'm going through all this, I'm going through all that, and the only reason I'm going through it is God's just putting it all on me and he's allowing it because he knows I'm able. And so I'm so great and I'm stronger than everybody else, I can go through all this. Trash talk. That's a lie from the pit of hell. James said, God tempts, tests no man. The temptation is not from God. But God, it says, with that temptation, also make a way to escape it that you can bear it. He is going to show you, he gives you wisdom on how to get out of that mess. If you're at work and you're told you have to take these certain courses that are contrary, totally contrary to the word of God. 
and you hear from God saying, and he says, don't do it, and you don't do it, that's a temptation, but he will make a way of escape. And you might say, what if they fire me? What if they do? If God told you not to do it, God's got something better for you. That's putting the word first place and zero compromise. I can remember, and this is, seems crazy so many years ago. I just kind of was, I never offered my opinion or put up my hand to answer questions in school. And so anyway, it was in grade 10 social. And they were studying the Neanderthal man and evolution and all this stuff. I don't know why, I was just minding my own business, had my head down, I was not involved. And she says, Arlene, stand up. And I was reasonably obedient in school. And so I stood, and so she asked me my opinion on this evolution and Neanderthal man and et cetera. And I said, uh, well, According to what I believe, I can't remember exactly, I said, I'm a Christian, and I believe the Bible, and we were created by God and not evolution, etc. She got red. She was so angry. And like, how dare you say this? That is such nonsense or whatever else. She said, now you sit down and don't you say anything else in this class again. I felt like saying, well, I didn't offer to say anything to begin with. <laughs> However, she mocked me, made fun of me, the students laughed at me. And I never thought much about it. Because I knew what I said was truth. Amen. Then in grade 11 social, a very similar thing happened. They asked me, stand up, ask me the question. I told them according to the word of God, sit down and you don't ever ever say something like that in this class again. Now this is a good many years ago. I don't know what it's like in school today. If it was like that back then, I don't know what it's like today. But let me tell you, you don't have to compromise. I wasn't there to impress the teachers. You are to be obedient in school, and you're to study hard and be obedient to your parents first place after Jesus. But you never compromise. And you might be made fun of. You might be picked on. Kids might laugh at you, ignore you, snicker as you walk down the hall. Bottom line, so what? There is a way of escape. God's made a way of escape. Pray and believe him for it. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory. So, where do we want to go? I thought we would finish this today. In Mark chapter 4, Let's, let's go to Mark chapter 4, verse 13. You know parables by this parable next. The sower sows the word, so we know we're talking about the word. The word is seed. And in the word of God is its life and power on its own. And these are they by the wayside, and Satan comes immediately to steal the word. I want you to realize every temptation, every opportunity to compromise is for one purpose, and it's for Satan to steal the word. He isn't interested in you personally. He wants to get the word out. He wants to shut you up. He wants to get you in a place of compromise so your testimony won't be any good. So he tries to take the word. Next verse. And this is what compromise will do. And then stony ground. It takes time to get our hearts to receive the word. But when we hear the word, we don't necessarily always just receive it. It takes time. We have to ask Holy Spirit to help us. It's a stony heart, but it can be built up. When we first get born again, we all have hard hearts. 
and no root in themselves. I believe that's talking about love because Ephesians says to pray, be rooted and grounded in love. Then affliction and persecution comes for the word's sake and they are offended. So what happens? Compromise. Those words come in what people are doing and there is the reason for compromise. So we have to keep, see, the word, we're born again, and it's in, everything's in our spirit. But when we get born again, we have a lot of stinking thinking. Our thinking isn't in line with the word of God. So what do we do? We have to get rid of our wrong thinking. We have to get rid of the weeds. Because the weeds are choking out the good seed. We don't just put more good seed. Anybody garden here, and you've got a garden, and here are your beans, and they're just growing great. And all of a sudden, the city just doesn't cut the grass, and all these dandelions blow in. Next thing you know, you've got all these dandelions. So you go out there. Well, there's all dandelions. I can't see my beans. So you get a sack of bean seed, and you plant more beans. And the weeds are growing and more weeds are coming. And that's what we've done as believers. You don't do that. The seed's there. What do you do? Get rid of the weeds. I don't plant more beans. I get rid of the weeds so the beans will grow. We are to get rid of cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other kinds. And being offended, we get that out so the word will grow and we've been doing it backwards and compromise allows the weeds to grow we have to do it God's way so let's pull out the weeds and how do we do that We'll talk about that next week. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. There's a way. You know how. Study Romans chapter 12. Renew your mind so you know what weeds to pull out. Please stand. Hallelujah. Glory to God.